This is an IGCSE Edexcel 1C paper talk through from January 2023. This question is about the three states of matter, solid, liquid and gas. The diagram shows how particles of a substance are arranged in two of these states. Complete the diagram to show how particles are arranged in the liquid state. So we need some gaps between the particles. But crucially, remember, those particles will sit at the bottom of the container. If you have a glass of water, the water molecules aren't just floating around. Identify the state of matter that contains particles with the least energy. That would be the solids. The table shows two changes of state. Complete the table by giving the name of each change of state. Solid to liquid, remember, is melting. Solid to gas, so going straight through from solid to gas. No liquid state, so that's sublimation. Explain why hot water evaporates more quickly than cold water. Hot water has higher kinetic energy meaning the weak intermolecular forces between the molecules are more easily overcome so you need to break those intermolecular forces in order for the water to evaporate This question is about elements, mixtures and compounds. Which of these is a formula of a molecule of an element? So molecule is two or more atoms bonded together, so not that. This is true. This is a compound. This is a compound. So the answer here is B. Which method can be used to separate an insoluble solid from a liquid? So something which doesn't dissolve from a liquid. That's simply filtration. Give the name of a method used to separate a mixture of liquids with different boiling points. The key thing here is a whole mixture of different boiling points, so that's why it's fractional distillation as opposed to simple distillation. A student adds a crystal of substance X to some water in a beaker and leaves the beaker for one day. The diagram shows the beaker immediately after adding the crystal and after one day. Which equation gives the correct state symbols for the process that occurs in the beaker? So we're going from a solid crystal and it's dissolving, so that will be aqueous. So it's not that, it's not that. That's the wrong way round. That is the correct answer. Which other process occurs in the beaker? Well, it's gonna be diffusion because it's not boiling because that's going from a liquid to a gas. It's not condensing, that's gas to liquid and sublimation, remember, is solid to gas. After one day, the student does two tests on the liquid in the beaker. The table shows the student's results. Identify substance X. So the flame test produces a lilac flame, which indicates that we have potassium ions. If we have acidified barium chloride solution, we see a white precipitate, it means we have sulfate ions. So this substance, always put the metal first, must be potassium sulfate. Really important that you learn those chemical tests. This question is about gases. Name the gas that is about 1% of dry air by volume. That's argon. Which is the most abundant gas in dry air by volume? So 78% of air is nitrogen. Around 21% is oxygen. 0.04% carbon dioxide, 1% argon. Then you've got water vapour. So you can see quite clearly that it's nitrogen. A student uses this apparatus to find the percentage by volume of oxygen in a mixture of oxygen and neon. This is the student's method. Measure the initial length of the column of gas in the inverted test tube. Leave the test tube for a week. Measure the final length. Some of the iron will rust, give the chemical name for rust. It's actually iron three oxide. Give a reason why neon does not react with the iron wool. Neon is unreactive. Remember, it's a noble gas because it has a full outer shell.
The table shows the student's results. Use the results to calculate the percentage of oxygen in the mixture of oxygen and neon. So work out the difference between those two heights. It's 45 millimetres. And then you do 45 over the original column height times by 100 to get 60%. Student uses this apparatus to investigate the dyes in food colouring A. Explain two mistakes that the student makes when setting up the apparatus. Straight away I can see the solvent, the water, is way too high. It needs to be beneath the reference line and the baseline needs to be drawn in pencil because you need something insoluble. So ink will contaminate the results. Waterline is too high and therefore dot A will dissolve in the water, which you don't want to happen. The student repeats the experiment but with no mistakes. The table shows the RF values for the two dyes in food colouring A. Complete the chromatic round for food colouring A by adding and labelling the dyes. So the RF value, remember, is the distance moved by dye divided by distance moved by solvent, the water. So to be a higher RF value, clearly that means that blue must have moved further compared with yellow. Give a reason why the blue dye has a larger RF value than the yellow dye, mainly because it's most likely to be more soluble. So it travels furthest in the given time. A student investigates the reactivities of four metals, aluminium, magnesium, copper, metal X. The student adds pieces of magnesium ribbon to aqueous solutions of sulfates of each metal. After a few minutes, the student removes the pieces of magnesium ribbon and records the appearance of each piece of magnesium. Table 1 shows the results. Name the substance that causes the brown coating on the magnesium. So we're looking at this brown coating here. That's when the magnesium reacts with copper sulfate to form, it's a displacement reaction, copper and magnesium sulfate. So the brown coating is likely to be copper. State why there is no change with magnesium sulfate solution. Well, a metal cannot displace itself. The student repeats the experiment with pieces of metal X instead of pieces of magnesium. Table two shows the results. Use the information from both tables to deduce the order of react reactivity of aluminium, magnesium, copper and metal X. So the fact that there's a brown coating on metal X means that it must be more reactive than copper. So I'm going to put copper at the bottom. The fact that there's no reaction with magnesium sulfate and metal X means that magnesium is more reactive than metal X. And you need to learn the reactivity series in order to know that magnesium is more reactive than aluminium. Give a possible identity for metal X. Again, you need to have learned that reactivity. So what sits between aluminium and copper? Maybe something like zinc. The ionic equation represents the reaction between magnesium and aluminium nitrate. Explain in terms of electrons which species acts as a reducing agent in this reaction. So a reducing agent by definition is oxidised, which means it loses electrons. According to oil rig, oxidation is loss of electrons, reduction is gain. So check these out. Which species has lost electrons? Well, it must be magnesium because it becomes a positive ion, which means it must have lost electrons. And that is the simplest way to get those two marks. This question is about polymers. This is a structure of a monomer. What is the name of this monomer? So it's unsaturated, which means we need an ene. 
it's only two carbons, so that's why it's chloroethene. There's the chloro. Complete the equation to show the repeat unit of the polymer that forms. So we break the double bond, elongate the bonds, and put all the other atoms back in. And that's the most straightforward way of getting those marks. A typical molecule of the polymer has a relative molecular mass of 2,490,000. Show that the number of monomer molecules needed to make this typical molecule is about 40,000. So work out the MR of the chloroethene. So it's two lots of carbons, three lots of hydrogens, plus chlorine. And then we take the MR of the polymer, divide it by the MR of chloroethene to get 39,840, which is approximately 40,000. So I know that my answer is right. These are two methods used to dispose of the polymer, burying in landfill sites, burning, discuss the environmental problems caused by these two methods of disposal. The issue with the polymer is that it is non-biodegradable, which means it isn't broken down by microorganisms. So as a result, it remains in landfill forever. Why is it non-biodegradable? Just point out here, because it's inert, it means unreactive. Burning the polymer produces, at best, carbon dioxide, but that's an issue because it's a greenhouse gas which contributes to global war warming. And then at worst, burning releases toxic gases. e.g. carbon monoxide. A different polymer molecule contains 10,600 atoms of carbon, 10,600 atoms of hydrogen, 31,800 atoms of chlorine. Deduce the empirical formula. Don't stress, list your elements and then list the number of atoms and then you basically want to get a ratio of one to something. So divide all these numbers by the smallest number, which is 10,600. To get a ratio of 1 to 1, 3. So our final answer here is CHCl3. The table shows the displayed formula of some organic compounds. Give a reason why compound X is not a hydrocarbon. The first thing we want to do here is list all the molecular and empirical formulae. So start with the molecular 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, C8, H18. And then the empirical is the simplest ratio, so divide by 2 to get C4H9. Over here we have C4H8, the empirical formula is therefore CH2. I won't worry about this one because of the oxygen. This is C4H8, and therefore the empirical formula is CH2. And then over here we have 1, 2, 3, 4, C4H10, the empirical formula is C2H5. Give a reason why X is not a hydrocarbon. I already pointed out X contains oxygen and therefore can't be a hydrocarbon. Give the letter of a compound that is a saturated hydrocarbon with the empirical formula CH2. So I worked out both of these compounds have an empirical formula of CH2, but we're after a saturated hydrocarbon, one with single bonds only, which is why it's W. Give the letter of the compound that produces 9 moles of water when 1 mole undergoes complete combustion. So we need to work our way through these molecular formula, completely combusting them, which means supplying lots of oxygen so that carbon dioxide and water are the byproducts. Get it balanced, and you can see that we have 1 mole undergoing complete combustion, producing 9 moles of water, which is why it's actually V. Give the structural formula of compound Y. So a structural formula is like a condensed displayed formula. So just write down what you can see. We have CH2, CH, CH2, CH3. 
explain why W and Y are isomers. So having a look at W and Y, we can say that we can see that they have the same molecular formula, but different displayed formula, which is our definition. Of Compound Z reacts with bromine in the presence of ultraviolet radiation. Write a chemical equation for this reaction. So Z is C4H10. I'm reacting it with bromine. Remember, bromine is diatomic. What happens is you produce HBr as a byproduct and then just sort out everything else so it becomes C4H9Br. So make sure all your atoms add up on the left and right side. What is the name for this type of reaction? It's substitution because you're swapping out one of those hydrogens for bromine. Describe how the combustion of a sulfur-free petrol in a car engine produces gases that can cause acid rain. Do not refer to carbon dioxide in your answer. Okay, so they want the method of producing acid rain, which isn't the sulfur and crude oil method because they've told us it's sulfur-free. So this is high temperatures in car engine. cause nitrogen and oxygen, which remember are just present in the air, and produce nitrogen oxides. Which dissolve in water, forming acid rain. This question is about ionic compounds. The table gives the formulae of some positive and negative ions and the formulae of some compounds containing these ions. Complete the table by giving the missing formulae. So remember, the metal always comes first. Double check to see if the charges are balanced. They are, so that's just sodium chloride. This time, Mg2 plus Cl minus. We have issues in that we need an extra Cl, so we write that as Cl2. And then down here we have Mg2 plus N3 minus. This one's hard. What number does 2 and 3 both go into 6? So just to show you, that means we need 3 Mg2 pluses. 2 N3 minus, so that becomes Mg3 N2. Give the name of the compound with the formula MgO. That's just magnesium oxide. Calculate the MR of Na3N. So we do three lots of sodium plus 14 to get 83. The diagram shows the arrangement of electrons in atoms of lithium and in an atom of oxygen. Describe the changes in the electronic configurations in lithium and oxygen when these atoms form lithium oxide. So what you can see taking place here is that for both atoms to have a full outer shell, each of the lithium atoms needs to lose an electron, and then the oxygen atom needs to gain two electrons. So write their new electronic configuration. It's just two for lithium and oxygen gains two electrons to become 2.8 as its new electronic configuration. Lithium oxide has a giant ionic structure. Explain why it has a high melting point. So very specific wording here. So you want to say that lithium oxide has strong electrostatic forces of attraction. Between oppositely charged ions which require a lot of energy to break.
No need to fill up all the lines as long as you're nice and specific. This question is about substances that contain covalent bonds. The diagram represents a molecule of oxygen. Describe the forces of attraction in a covalent bond. So really you're defining a covalent bond, which is the electrostatic attraction between nuclei and a shared pair of electrons. which you can see right there that they're sharing electrons. The table shows the boiling points of group seven elements. Remember, those are the halogens. Explain the trend in boiling points. Right, you can see as you descend the group, the boiling point increases. Why is that? It's because the atoms have more shells, therefore they're larger, meaning that the, the intermolecular forces between them are stronger. So first of all, state the trend. Always keep an eye on that periodic table so you're happy with why I'm saying as you descend the group because it goes fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine and astatine. So as you descend the group, the boiling points increase. Why is that? So the intermolecular forces are stronger and require more energy to break. Graphite is a naturally occurring form of carbon. Explain why graphite is soft and conducts electricity. Refer to structure and bonding in your answer. So let's refer to its structure first of all. Graphite is a giant covalent structure. where each carbon atom is bonded to three others as opposed to four. And what does that mean? Meaning that there are delocalized electrons which are free to move. And that's all important because it allows graphite to conduct electricity This is a huge question on chemical structures. Now we'll refer to the fact that it's soft. So graphite is arranged in layers. And remember those layers are held together by weak forces, which means the layers can slide over each other. A student uses this apparatus to record the maximum temperature in the reaction between solutions of hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide. This is the student's method. Name a suitable piece of apparatus to add 20 centimetres cubed of solution to the beaker. A measuring cylinder is absolutely fine here. Before the reaction, both solutions have a temperature of 21 degrees Celsius. The heat energy change Q for the reaction is this. Calculate the theoretical maximum temperature reached by the mixture, which has a mass of 50 grams. Your specific heat capacity is this. Oh, wow. Okay, this is an unusual one. Because for once, rather than finding Q, you're being asked to find the maximum temperature. So sub in all your values in the correct place. The mass we know is 50. Specific heat capacity they've told us is 4.2. We're after the temperature change. So sort that all out. Do 50 times 4.2. And then solve for x by doing 2880 divided by 210. And then to find the final temperature, we add the number we've just found to the starting temperature to get 34.7 as our maximum temperature reached. Give a reason why the maximum temperature recorded by the student is lower than the theoretical maximum temperature calculated. It's always heat loss to the surroundings.
in the reaction 0 0.05 moles of hydrochloric acid completely react, calculate the molar enthalpy change in kilojoules per mole, include a sign in your answer. So here is your equation. Q we've been told is 2,880 joules, but we need that in kilojoules, so we divide by 1,000. The number of moles we've been told is 0 0.05. And then just be careful with that sign because the temperature went up. It was an exothermic reaction, so we need to add a negative sign there. This question is about the reaction between magnesium and dilute nitric acid. A student reacts dilute nitric acid with an excess of magnesium powder as a first step in the preparation of dry crystals of hydrated magnesium nitrate. This is the equation. Explain why it's important that the magnesium is in excess. It's to make sure that all that nitric acid reacts and therefore ensuring that the solution only contains magnesium nitrate as opposed to any nitric acid. The student adds 0 0.75 grams of magnesium to 0 0.025 moles of nitric acid. Calculate the mass of magnesium in grams that remains at the end of the reaction. So in order to solve this, we write out the equation. So it's effectively limiting reagent, excess reagent one. So I'm just, for argument's sake, going to cross out the magnesium and put 0. 0 0.025 moles as my moles of nitric acid and I'm going to work out the mass of magnesium I need to fully react with 0 0.025 moles of nitric acid. Check the mole connection, it's 2 to 1 so we need to halve that number. The MR of magnesium is 24. To find the mass we do MR times number of moles. So we do 24 times 0. 0.125 to get 0 0.3 grams. So that's the quantity of magnesium we needed to react, but we had 0 0.75 given to us in the reaction. So just work out the difference between those two numbers. So spare in excess, we have 0 0.45 grams of magnesium. Describe how the student can obtain dry crystals of hydrated magnesium nitrate from the mixture at the end of the reaction. So check our reagents, it's magnesium and nitric acid. Make sure you go through the steps. So I'm just going to say add magnesium and nitric acid to a beaker and stir, add excess magnesium to ensure all of the nitric acid reacts. Don't feel like you need to write the symbols. I'm only doing it because it's faster. You can write it out in words. Because you've got excess solid, it means you need to filter the solution to remove any unreacted magnesium. Then you want to heat your solution of magnesium nitrate in an evaporating basin. Why do you want to do that? Because you want to evaporate some of the water. Leave to cool. Filter off excess liquid and then leave to dry. Give a method here. Something like in a drying oven is good. On filter paper would also be fine. The student repeats the experiment and records the volume of hydrogen gas collected. The graph shows the student's results. Use the graph to calculate the rate of reaction in centimeters cubed per second at t equals 40 seconds. So first of all, we need to draw a tangent here 
And then we need to find the gradient of that tangent by doing change in y over change in x. So the change in y is just 100 divided by the change in x, which is 35 to get 2.86. Your answer could vary slightly and there is room for that in the mark scheme. This question is about hydrated compounds. Crystals of hydrated barium chloride contain water of crystallization. A student uses this apparatus to remove and collect the water from some crystals. This is the student's method. Give a reason why the student repeats steps three and four until the mass is constant. It's to ensure that all that water has been driven off, basically. Calculate the mass of barium chloride that forms in tube A. So we need the dry version because we don't want any water in there. So we work out the difference between these two numbers to get 5.2 grams. Calculate the mass of water lost. So you need the difference between these two numbers because this one has water in it and this one doesn't. So that's just 0 0.9 grams. Determine the value of x. So this is an empirical formula calculation. It just looks more difficult. But you start by effectively drawing a vertical line where the dot is. And that will sort you out in terms of how you arrange your table. As always, mass, mr, number of moles. Formula triangle here. You're ready to go. Put in the various masses. You've just found out that there's 5.2 grams of barium chloride. 0 0.9 grams of water. They've kindly given us the MRs. To find the number of moles, we do mass divided by MR. So that's 0 .0 0 0.025, 0 0.05. Identify the smallest number and divide both numbers by that. So X is 2. Describe a physical test to show that the water in test tube B is pure. The key thing here is it's the physical test, so you need to check the boiling point. And that boiling point, if it's pure, should just be 100 degrees Celsius. A sample containing 0 0.02 mole of hydrated copper sulfate is heated using the same apparatus. The products in the reaction are anhydrous copper 2 sulfate and water. Give the meaning of this symbol. It means that the reaction is reversible. Describe how the reaction can be used to show that a liquid contains water. This is the test for water, remember. White anhydrous copper sulfate turns blue in the presence of water, so that's what you need to point out. Add water to white anhydrous Copper sulfate, it should turn blue. Calculate the maximum number of water molecules in tube B after the sample of hydrated copper 2 sulfate has completely reacted. One mole of a substance contains 6 times 10 to the 23 particles. So we know we had 0 0.02 moles of hydrated copper sulfate. So check the mole connection, it's 1 to 5. So just multiply that by 5 to get 0 0.1 moles of water being made. And then if one mole of a substance has 6 times 10 to the 23 particles, well, we've only got 0 0.1 moles. So that's your sum. So the answer is 6 times 10 to the 22.